Coming up on this edition of NTV. With Grenadiers now rolling off the line, we take a look back at its incredible journey from pub to production. We're in Mallorca to catch up with Ineos Britannia to get the latest on preparations for the 37th America's Cup. And in Manchester, we see how Ineos's new charity, The Forgotten 40, is helping enrich the lives of young children. All this and the latest news from around the Ineos group. This is InTV. Hello and welcome to InTV. Today we're coming to you on a cold and foggy morning in the Chilterns in the south of England at a special test drive event where the media are getting the chance to put the Grenadier through its paces both on and off-road. And six years since its inception and after over 1.8 million kilometres of testing, the Grenadier has finally arrived. So let's head back to a small pub in Knightsbridge to find out where it all began.
what an amazing journey. And I'm really pleased we can carry on now because I've got the CEO of Ineos Automotive, Lynn Calder, with me. So Lynn, this event we've got today, tell us a bit about it. What we're uh, doing is culminating a five-week event where we have been showcasing the Grenadier to multiple journalists from around the world. And we started five weeks ago at the top peak of Scotland in John, John O'Groats. And we've made our way down south and today we will finish at the Grenadier pub in London. Fantastic. So a lot of journalists have been looking at the car. What sort of feedback have you had? So the feedback has been really good. I think we've been doing a really good mix of quite difficult off-road driving and on-road. And I think that we've really been able to showcase the car to journalists. And I think the feedback has been really positive about the car, about the event. Every single car magazine will be sold out tomorrow, mainly from Ineos people, probably. Excellent. Lynn, thank you very much indeed. Wow, six years in the making and looking at the final result, it's been worth the wait. From off-road to on water, another challenge that's no less daunting is the America's Cup. And Ineos is back as challenger of record. So let's head over to Parma and see how preparations are going for Ineos Britannia and get an insight into how our teams are working together to take on the challenge of sport's oldest trophy. We've got our test boat uh, called T6, very important part of the programme. This test boat has to be under 12 metres long, LEQ 12 under the protocol, and this allows us to sail and experiment various concepts that we need to understand in order to design the, the race boat RB3, which we'll be racing in uh, 2024. This boat is built for four crew. On the big boat we have eight, so we have four guys who control the boat and four cyclists or grinders who provide energy. It has been a really big year for Ineos Britannia. We've taken on the merge of this relationship with Mercedes F1. The next six months is very much focused on P6 and the data we get out of that boat. We have a lot of things to tick off technically. We've got some new wings coming online, some new hull shapes to look at, and they'll all feed forward into the design of the race boat. Coming from an F1 background, this is an opportunity to apply the cycling world and the top level engineering of the F1 world. Aerodynamically we want the guys to be as invisible as possible on the yacht. We want them to be not sticking out into the external airflow. From a safety point of view we want the guys to be able to exit in the event of an emergency. In the event that a cyclor has passed out we want to be able to ensure that they can be rescued. It looks like we've got two fairly good options there haven't we? Because I think you're right, 15 seconds you can drop in, click, the other two guys are ready to just pull out. <laughs> on this America's Cup boat, the cycles are there to basically power everything above the waterline, so we are the engines. Big differences between being a grinder and being a cycle. Firstly, is the training environment. Come on, Mark, keep your eyes open, mate. Keep your eyes open. <laughs> being a grinder, you're spending up to 17 hours a week on the grinding machine in the gym, which can be a pretty grim existence, to be honest. We do most of our training now outdoors, which is epic. Here in Majorca, it's perfect for it because it's great roads, weather's generally good, or it's a perfect place to come for a training camp. We've had reasonable load cycling for the last kind of year, 18 months. We're gradually turning ourselves from grinders into cyclers. 
now we've got to the point that we can come on these camps and it's epic to be out riding with the Grenadiers boys and see how hard they push in the mountains and that really gives you a boost and makes you push the extra little bit in training. First off, just great guys. Love the team atmosphere and getting stuck in and pretty handy on the bike when they stay on it. They pretty much follow their own little group of themselves and then we integrate and see them out on the roads and kind of set off together, but generally they've been doing the same courses as us. Cyclos, the way that they ride in the bike is pretty impressive. They're a lot bigger than what we are. I don't think they like the climbing so much as what, as what we do. They ride with us a little bit, we see them out on the road. When we're doing like the sprint work and they're doing it with us, they just smash it. The relationship with Ineos Sport as a wider organisation, and specifically with the cyclos, is pretty important because we are able to benefit from other sports that are at the top of their games. It's amazing to be able to sort of reach across and collaborate on human physiology or cycling specifics. It's a great opportunity and we're very lucky to have it. We're incredibly privileged as a group to have Ineos supporting us in this program and to have the opportunity to train with the Grenadiers and the knowledge to tap into. You couldn't pick a better company and better team to be involved with at this stage for us, certainly. What we're all looking forward to is winning the America's Cup and the opportunity that awaits us in 2024 in Barcelona and the potential that we could lift the America's Cup there. A few years ago, research was published that showed that over 40% of children in the UK had their lives impacted by poverty. It's a shocking statistic and one that has real consequences for their future. To help to alleviate the burden, the founders of INEOS, many of whom came from the same areas, decided to set up a fund to improve and enrich those children's life experiences. Let's hear more about the Forgotten 40. The idea came from Jim Radcliffe reading an article in the Sunday Times about children who were in, in Britain who were still living in disadvantaged circumstances. I started here as a deputy head back in 2004. I was then appointed as the head teacher from 2011. And then in 2015, I was asked to then go and support at St. Patrick's as well. I love my job. The issues that face our families in this neighbourhood is over 80% of our families come from 10% of the most deprived areas of the country and the most deprived housing. And obviously that impacts on the resources that our families have. About a third of our families have English as an additional language and the majority of our children come to school not ready for learning and have issues around communication and language and their personal and social development. We can't teach children unless they're feeling happy and balanced. Forgotten 40 is a project that aims to alleviate poverty in schools. It focuses on the 100 most disadvantaged schools in the country. The schools get £20,000 each year for three years. Poverty is not the head teacher's problem, it's not their fault, but it's something that's falling on their shoulders more and more and more. £20,000 that the head teachers get, they can choose how they want to spend it that year. So we were one of the first schools to be part of the initiative, and so obviously we feel extremely privileged to be part of that. Straight away, you just want to start sit down with the staff and brainstorm all of the ideas that you can have. And you just want to enrich the experience for the children. There's so many ideas that particularly the teachers have, because they're with the children on a day-to-day -day in the classroom. So what it's been able to do for us, um, obviously you look at your geography of your school. So we are right on the verge of the city centre and we have got to exploit the opportunities there. So it's rich in cultural capital, there's museums, there's libraries, there's theatres, things that our children just wouldn't normally be able to access because they are expensive to our families and they're not a priority. The funding has helped us with other things other than just taking the children out on trips to enrich the curriculum. We've also been able to fund an allotment at this school where we've been able to also fund for a member of staff to be able to support our children. 
Our children generally don't really have gardens, so they don't have that experience of growing plants or growing fruits and vegetables. So we've just had a wonderful harvest, which has absolutely been fantastic for them. Even though we provide curriculum music, as all schools do, and um, we were able to identify children who might have an additional talent with an instrument. Parents wouldn't have that sort of 20, 30 pound to be able to take their children to a private music lesson. Whereas with the INEOS funding that we've got, we've been able to provide that for our children. Building networks of, of teachers um, is, is essential. We found that at the first conference, the pilot conference, we had the 20 head teachers down to INEOS which is very strange because they're coming from the most disadvantaged areas with the most advantaged area, opposite Harrods in London. We couldn't stop them talking. It's just the fact that they were in a room with other head teachers who understood their context and they didn't have to explain themselves. And we did give them time at the beginning to explain uh, how they spent the money. And it was really inspirational. And that's how the project has taken off. It's really good to get together as head teachers to be able to share ideas and share good practice. So today, four of the schools that are in our network are coming together to listen to a speaker from INEOS, from Miller, and get together, have a little bit of a social and network. I'm here today because uh, Elaine Crotty spoke to me about the Forgotten 40 about 18 months ago and asked if I would be willing to come and just do a talk at their conference just about my experience within INEOS. So I've done a couple of talks for head teachers and they asked me if I would be willing to come to a school and do it for a broader church of head teachers, to which I said I would love to. Before I went to work for INEOS, I was based up in Manchester, so I have a bit of an affinity with the Northwest. I sort of felt it was a great opportunity for me to come home and also give back a bit to a community that I'm really proud of. Well, the world experiences that we're providing through INEOS and head teachers are providing, it's given children experiences that they would never have in any other way. And I remember one family talking about they went to the zoo and they took the parents with them as well. And the parents were as engaged, if not more so, than the children. In fact, they had to tell the parents to stand back because they were the children were at the back and the parents were at the front. But they hadn't seen anything like that either. And it was lovely to see the conversation that followed on from that and the fact that it allows them to have that sort of connection with their child and a common shared experience as well. We are starting to see a difference with the children, particularly around their mental health and well-being, and also around their conversations when they're, they're more confident being able to talk about something that they've done because they've been out on a trip or they've enjoyed an experience. And that really is having an impact on their confidence levels and their own mental health and well-being as well, but also in the quality of the work that they're producing for us in, in class. These are truly humbling stories and the work of the Forgotten 40 and the impact it's having is something we can all be proud of. Now let's find out what else is going on across the INEOS group. INEOS and Chinese giant Sinopec have completed two of their four significant deals which were first announced last year. INEOS has acquired 50% of the Seco petrochemical company as well as signing a joint venture with Sinopec to produce ABS plastic. And building on this relationship, INEOS and Sinopec are hoping to sign a third joint venture later this year, this time to build a new HDPE plant in Tianjin. In the sports news, INEOS Sport have welcomed Jean-Claude Blanc as its new CEO. Jean-Claude has an extensive resume in high-level sports management and will work closely with our performance director, Sir Dave Brailsford, to develop a dedicated state-of-the-art facility that will help expand INEOS Sports' global brand and presence. Another major milestone has been smashed by Children's Health and Wellbeing Initiative, The Daily Mile. Now over 4 million children across 90 countries are part of this amazing scheme. And last, but by no means least, March saw a landmark event in carbon, capture and storage as INEOS's Green Sand project demonstrated the world's first ever carbon capture and storage value chain designed to mitigate climate change. With support from European Commissioner Ursula von der Leyen, this was truly a milestone towards net zero carbon emissions. It is thanks to pioneers like you that Europe is leading the way in the race to net zero emissions. The first ever full value chain for carbon capture and storage in Europe. You're showing that it can be done. Thank you very much for that. 
was a royal affair, as His Highness Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark inaugurated the first injection of CO2 into the Greensound cavities, 1.8 kilometres beneath the Ineos Nini platform in the North Sea. I am pleased uh, to initiate this process. Your Royal Highness, I can confirm that we have now started to inject the first CO2 in the North Sea. Congratulations. And this is a very INEOS-led project. Along with our partners, Vintershaw, but very much INEOS front and centre, doing what INEOS does best. If the project proves successful, then Greensand could provide Denmark with the ability to store up to 8 million tonnes of carbon every year, as much as 10% of their entire CO2 output. Well, that's it for this episode of INTV, and I'm sure you'll agree it's been great to see the INEOS of Grenadier in the wild. And if you want to find out more about the Grenadier, or where you can find one of our showrooms, then check out the website below. So Tom, where to next? How about Denmark? Let's do it. Right, see you next time. Off we go. How are you feeling, Tom? Oh, I'm feeling confident. So do you know what? I'm thinking about your first adventure in a Grenadier. I think definitely for me, Scotland, but I've not been up there before. How about you? I think I'm going to go into Europe, put it back in its habitat in terms of going up mountains. Maybe finding some lake size to go and camp by. Starting to test it off road a bit yeah. more, putting it where it needs to be. I think what I've been really impressed with the Grenadier is just that transition from off road. On road? Yeah. It's just seamless. I think that's the real surprise for most people. You expect it to drive noisy, uncomfortable, bouncy. But we're on road having a conversation though, it's comfortable. It's a lovely very, very drive. Cool. It's just super.